have a little hobby horse about trans avalanche transceivers and um, and that is that if it, uh, we're going to concentrate on this session this afternoon is is avalanche search and rescue um but the thing i always, the big point i always make is that's the that's the end result right um the best chance of rescuing or fight uh, surviving an avalanche if you're buried is your companions the people you're skiing with so first of all, the first golden rule is always make sure you're skiing with at least one other person, preferably a, a small group, um, because you're, 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 that really is the best chance of survival. But the best chance of survival is never to get caught in, the, in an avalanche in the first place. But there are actually some very, very big and very obvious golden rules. I mean, we're, we're actually in the middle of one very, very obvious one at the moment. What, what would that... God, help me out. What, what, right now, if you went and skied, say, a south-facing uh, gully, what's going to happen? And well, It's going to probably have arch on you because if there's any snow left in it um, because it's had sun for six hours. The snow is absolutely saturated. If it's steep enough and in the gully and you set it off, it's going to build up and just, you know, so, you know, that's obvious because it's, it's, it's wet. It's absolutely soaking snow. Um, if you take, if you picked up this, um, I shoved it into a, um, into a water bottle. You've probably got nearly 90% of water in this now. Each uh, a kilo of um, of, uh, of this, no, oh sorry, um, yeah, a liter of water is one kilo. You yeah, know that's nothing. <laughs> Can you imagine, yeah, you know, um, a few thousand kilos of uh, uh, or liters of uh, sort of snow coming down? You've got an incredible amount of weight at the moment. So so heavy and wet. So. That's a, that right now is a golden rule, but there are a lot of many other um, fairly obvious signs that, that too often we, when people are skiing around off piece they just miss. They don't take into account uh, what the wind has been doing. They don't think about the actual shape of the terrain. Um, you know, there's a big difference between convex and concave terrain in terms of how the snow is moving, is being held on the mountain. And uh, lots and lots of little signs. So. Yes, the avalanche search and rescue bit is important. It's really important to know how, how to conduct a fast, efficient search, rescue. But more important is to understand how to avoid, how avalanche is st uh, happen and how to avoid them in the, in the first place. The, the, the biggest factor, I think, in, in avalanche uh, awareness and understanding that's been overlooked for years and years is actually the human factor. Too, too, much, too often people just follow the guide. And uh, the guide knows everything. He knows exactly where it's safe to go. There's not enough communication. It's so important to have, you know, if you've got ten, six pairs of eyes watch, looking around and checking what, and they have some understanding of what's going on. Say, hang on, Nick, do you really think that's a good idea that we should ski there? I may have missed something. You know, there might be obvious sign that I might have missed. So it's really important that actually you, everybody in the group has a bit of an understanding and can and the way communicate. Um, Avalanches is a problem, but don't forget there are other problems. And right now, actually, more serious is go out nine o'clock uh, on a on a um, uh, an east a west facing slope, particularly west, and it's been freezing overnight and it's bumpy and steep, and the chance of a big fall and a big slide and and because the snow is going fast, rocks everywhere. So, yeah, that's far more that's far more worrying to me right now. Suddenly having a fall early in the day than uh, than avalanches at the moment. Yeah, so yeah, don't just consider. There are lots of tricks, uh, things off piece we have to worry. about. Does anyone know what the avalanche risk is today? Can you want to look at the bulletin. Two, two to three places. Yeah, I, I looked at the. Signs. That might be so the Vat Hans bulletin. I only had a look at the Savoir one last night, so they might have upped it. And they said one to two, mm -hmm. one in the morning, going to two. Well, going to two really. This is, comes back to what Nick says. Going to two immediately on east facing slopes from about ten o'clock because they get a lot of sun from dawn going to two on south facing slopes from maybe about 11 yeah. and going to two on west south west facing and slopes five, after lunch five on the east facing slope uh, yeah. by, by two o'clock <laughs> exactly so the other that overall yeah. or, overall avalanche yeah. risk that's a that's a global risk you have to think locally when you're going off piece it gives you an idea it gives you a feeling for what's happening uh, how do you know that uh, without going and looking at the actual avalanche bulletin on the internet or going to the tourist office or the pistas What's an easy way of telling what the overall avalanche risk is? What's, what do you see around the resort? Flag. Flags. So yellow flag, one to two. Checkerboard flag, three and four. And black flag, five. Now, a lot of people get into their heads, three, well, that's about medium, isn't it? Three, you're getting into risky 
uh, territory. Uh, More, uh, most avalanche victims occur when it's on three. But uh, in France, uh, over the last 30 years, I got the statistics from the French Avalanche Research, Research Institute, of uh, the people who were caught in avalanche, only 10% died at risk one or two. At risk three or four, 80% of the victims died, and at risk five, 10%, because most people aren't skiing at risk five off piste or skiing at all. So you can see, the risk, risk three, you're really getting, in France, getting into risky territory. In Switzerland, they have a, they, risk two is also quite <coughs> dangerous in Switzerland. They, for various reasons, they, they haven't quite synced up on their, their avalanche uh, um, scales. So you've, you've got to, so you think risk one or two, like it is today, uh, if you're sensible, you can ski around in between the piece and things and it's fairly safe. Risk three, you're skiing in, bet in between the piece, you can, just in between the piece here, you can get avalanched and if there's a terrain trap buried, and that happens every year, some people get uh, killed. Um, terrain trap is uh, terrain when the shape of the land funnels the snow in to a point where you might get you might land at the bottom of a, a little dip, the snow will come down on top of you. You could be two, three metres below quite a small fall. So you might have a fall. 30 centimetre slab that you kick off, and it piles up to two metres. Um, and again, there's a, more, more French statistics. I don't know if the Swiss have the same experiences, but in France, of people who are buried by an avalanche, so completely covered, 50% uh, of those who have an avalanche beacon die. So this is, again, don't get... don't. Try, try to avoid avalanches, do some reading and uh, find out how you can avoid and Nick's given some, and we'll no doubt this week, give a lot more advice about the kind of conditions that cause avalanches. Um, so really, the, the, the emphasis, although we're going to look at searching today, is to avoid avalanches. They're dangerous, even if you have a beacon, you, it's just like a little joker in the pack. It's something, to talk about people who don't have beacons, 90% die if they get covered by the slide, because it takes so much longer to dig people out. And again, if you're buried more than about a metre, uh, it, it just takes uh, so long to dig, pe find people, probe for them, localise them, dig them out. So there again, terrain traps are very important. Looking at the land that you're crossing, is there a steep valley, is there other holes? Teen, Teen and Val d'Azer are notorious for these holes. So Bomb get, holes. Yeah. yeah. And there was a guy, was, um, somebody who was actually witnessed it, uh, who posted <coughs> Stonehead. A guy skied just next to one of these little holes. The uh, side gave away, so micro avalanche, and he got buried three meters, you know, and, and about two meters away from the piece. Mm. So, I have a colleague here. Last year, year before, I went with a client on the on the uh, drag lift by the competition piste, and they left to cross to go to the piste, 50 meters, and they were caught. A lot of people think that off-piste skiing is like the next step of difficulty. Once you've gone green, blue, red, black, then you go off-piste. But there's one very, very big difference between piste and off-piste skiing, and that's responsibility. On the piste, the responsibility is that of the security services to make it safe for you, and you rely on that. As soon as you cross those poles, one metre on the other side of those poles, it's completely your responsibility. You're making decisions for yourself about what's safe and what isn't. Yes, being really skiing in a responsible, sensible manner, considering the avalanche danger, yeah. then you, you only ever put one person down that slope at a time. So that's one of the, go I said about golden rule, always ski in a small group, or at least with one other person watching. So one person is skiing the slope. Sometimes it's a big slope, you may have the whole group in there, but if you're a little bit worried, then one person. Okay, the rest of you are waiting in a nice safe spot, you're watching carefully. If the skier goes down, let's imagine you get that, so that skier gets caught. Um, we've, we've indicated there are two main types of avalanche. Um, David talked about uh, slab avalanches, and actually 90% of the time we're more worried about, as he mentioned, the, the wet snow ones, which fun to go down gullies. These ones we're looking at, no, we look at over here. Up. These are all wet snow avalanches, mainly coming from one point. It's not entirely obvious, but usually... Big like this. Yeah, yeah, Big like that. They plan out like that. Anyway, the slab avalanches are the ones that mainly concern us. And that's all about the, the tension of the slope. It's, they're caused by the wind. They usually they usually release just uh, below the convexity of a slope. So a convex slope. How do you know if you're on a convex slope? For it, if you can't see the bottom, if you can't see the bottom. You're looking at, and it's disappearing. That you're on a convex slope. When you think about it. There's more 
snow that like under our forces of gravity are being pulled down the mountain all through all the time and uh, and so on a convex slope there's more tension convex slope it's more compressed and they tend to release just below the convexity not always but that's the, the kind of obvious now um, and because it's tension the slope's gone this guy's caught being caught in this avalanche um, they it's more or less very, very, very unlikely that there's going to be a second avalanche. That slope is gone. The tension's out. It's all any snow that was going to go down has gone in that instant. So it's safe to go into that, uh, into and follow because remember, speed is really important here. We talk about a 15-minute window, um, uh, and statistically, as they back up that you're, uh, after 15 minutes, you, if you've survived that initial avalanche after 15 minutes your chances of really drop off but the first 15 minutes are crucial so you can go in there um, and now but it's not a case of going straight to avalanche transceiver there so often there are little clues for instance when that person goes, gets caught in the avalanche everybody needs to watch what happens really carefully um, and try and memorize the last posi position you saw that person in and then as soon as it's uh, you know, stopped, go in there and try and go to that point and mark that position. That's the first thing. That pers person could then continue on down looking at the, through the debris to see if there's any clues. This is often something that's forgotten about. Everybody goes, oh, transceivers. Yeah, let's get on with that. But uh, there could be a hand, there could be a glove, there could be a ski, you know, anything. And so often you can't see from the top, but, um, you know, so... Go and send a, send a few people down to search for clues. Right, then, no clues, nothing. You know there's one person in the debris. The next stage, then, is, is to start thinking about your, the transceiver. And you could, if you've got a big group... Right, let's, I presume he went off down there, because I can't see him up here. So, uh, there he is down there. Thank you, <coughs> Bernard. Right. So, the... Um, uh, <coughs> it's going to be on anyway. I'll switch it, just so you can see that warm-up, by the way. Let's see how many... What the battery life is there. 56, that's not great, it's just uh, on the limit, but that'll do. Yeah, per limit, yeah. Okay, um, all avalanche trend, once it goes, the first thing it did, if I just do that again, you can't, the light's really bright. The first thing this one does, and you switch it on, it does a little check, it tells you the, the um, uh, battery amount, and then it uh, just says TR quickly, and then that screen goes completely blank, and the only thing that tells you that it's transmitting is that... Um, uh, well, it's on, and it's also, and this is very important, and they, all all the avalanche transceivers do the same. They all flash a little red light. They all have a LED that flashes up, no matter which uh, what model you you go for. And so, if you're a little bit unsure as to whether you're in transmit or receive, just look for the light and see if it's flashing. You can see that one flashing there. And this one, um, most of you are going to be trying this. We've got a couple of other models you can play around with as well, but I've got eight of these, so. Well, fact, I've got, got two, two and I've got, got some other models. Um, uh, to go to search, you press in the, the red button firmly until SE appears in the screen and then you release it immediately. So, okay, and straight away it's, going, it's picking up a signal. There you are. Um, just double check, nobody else is on RA, so there should only be one. In fact, uh, what about the Autobox I had just now? Is that still in? Yeah. Is it, on? Is it, it might possibly be on. Sounds yeah. like it's two actually. Yeah. So and also there you have to turn that. There we go. And he's also Bernard's a long way away. There's a good chance. So there you go. That was a good demonstration. When yeah. you start your search, everyone needs to either turn their beacons off or go into search mode because yeah. otherwise you end up following people around the. As it, I, it happens. As I've just said, I think I personally, if you're not involved in actually doing the search, then you should be on. Um, you should switch off. Um, the um, I should actually just say there are three. Did you switch it off there? Why is it stop beeping? Ah, it because he's too far away. Yeah, oh, and right. my and the other one was the me. The other one that was here. Yeah. Stop it. What, what is the effective range? Well, they all vary a little bit, um, but I think these are effective over about 25 meters, 25 to 30. Depends a lot on the battery life, both of the one you're searching for, and um, it also depends a little bit on the position. Uh, uh, I'll show that in a minute, um, but um, uh, some of them are a little bit better than that. Actually, the, some of the analog ones are better yeah. than the digital ones. Um, but 
we up possibly up to 50 meters if you're lucky if you're really lucky and this is um maybe this is the first thing there are three stages of a search with one of these the um the primary stage is is finding a signal in the first place right so here's the avalanche um and here's a group up there and there's somebody buried there let's say um this is a uh, 100 meters roughly let's say and a couple of hundred meters long all right now these things only are only affected say 25 meters if you're lucky the primary search you're standing up there um you've sent some people down they have found no clues whatsoever so they um you've got um uh on a hundred one person buried 100 meters wide avalanche you might have a couple of people <coughs> involved with the primary search but let's imagine there's actually only three of you and you've one's been caught one's gone down to look for clues and you're standing at the top of the transceiver so um uh, you've got to do the whole search your first you're gonna um you need to you cover the entire avalanche debris we're not going to be outside the debris um for very very unknown I have never heard of anybody being outside debris, but so you're going to cover the, the the debris, and you're going to traverse across. Um, and uh, whether you do this on skis or on foot, I would say always oh, start to try and do it on skis because it will take you forever, on foot, probably. But of course, it may be so difficult to train um, that it might be it might be easier to go on foot. But probably you try and stay on skis, and then you come back. Across this way, and uh, this distance, obviously, no more than about 15 20 meters. Yeah, because if I don't, because you could miss it. Okay, and you keep going backwards and forwards until you pick up a signal. Oh, got a signal. Okay, um, and uh, uh, from now on, you're into your secondary phase of search. Now, when in the old days with the digitals, um, sorry, the analogs, we used to practice a grid search. Um, was being the most effective way. What I mean by that is that you would, um, um, you've got a signal, you know, somebody's buried here, uh, you, you pick up a signal and you walk down, the, you probably go down the, or ski down the fall line, and the signal gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and then it starts to fade. So you come back to where you thought the, uh, the strongest signal was, um, and in fact this is how we do the final search, the tertiary part, the fine search at the end. You come back to where the lo where you thought the loudest point was. You you would uh, you have a volume control on the on the analog ones. I'm not going to dwell on this too long because we're now in, you're not going to buy analogs anymore. So you don't need to worry too much. But you you turn down the volume a little. You go either you go perfect um, one way or the other. You go maybe this way, and of course the signal fades. So you come back to there. You go this way, it gets louder, and then it fades again. Come back to where you thought the loudest point was. Go that way, it fades and so on. And so gradually, you're turning the volume down, you're getting closer and closer and closer until you arrive on top of the victim. Now, today with um, the, the digitals, you don't need to do that, which is great news because that's a lot of walking. Um, uh, and yet you have, you have a sort of pattern, uh, it's quite yeah, uniform, so it's, in some ways it's quite good and it's great for the fine search. You've got a sort of system, but actually we don't need to do that now. And it appears that now is a little bit more random, but actually it's not. Um, and that's because uh, I don't really want to get it too wet. But this thing gives out. Middle uh, dongle. Oh, I'm missing. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's giving out um, a signal called flux lines. That it uh, it will this uh, the one you're searching with will pick up the signal given by the one buried um, on the nearest point on the curve that it's uh, the, it's giving out the signal. Now that might that. The thing to remember is it's more, sometimes it can be almost a straight line A to B, but only if it's very, very lucky. Usually it's going to be picking it up uh, in, in a bit of a, uh, um, uh, out in a curving line. Okay, so, it, so once you've found a signal and you find the strongest point of that signal around the circumference, uh, you know, as you, uh, I'll show you how we do a sort of first initial find, you'll don't then go, oh, it's going to be directly down that line because the likelihood is it's actually going to be over there. Yeah, but the first thing I would do, I'm um, standing, at the, I've picked up a signal, and we know the avalanche is down here. Um, you often find that actually, if I was to, um, oh, first of all, we need to pick up a signal. Come on, let's go down here. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, get some um, You've been this. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I... 
It's going to be hard walking up. Have you have a signal? I would imagine so. Are oh, yeah, the I only yeah. Oh, I've got a signal now. Just come on down here. The first thing is, I'm right, I must be right on the edge of the signal because I've only just picked up the first signal. And the first thing I need to do is perhaps just go down a little bit further to get a really good signal because the very first signal is often very confusing. I'm not quite sure which way to go. I always just like to go a bit further down. Now, I don't know if you can see this flashing. But it's saying 42 meters. Uh, actually, then it says 35. 35. Now, if I just spin this round, I'll get all sorts of different readings. In um, can I have a ski stick, a second, very quickly? Um, I've got quite a good signal until about there. there that line, there. and now between in this area, I've got nothing. Ooh. <laughs> until about there okay now what'll be interesting is I'll have quite a good signal all the way through here to about here and then again I'll have a dead spot until come down again sorry from there dead until there and look at those those two mirror each other so the corridor of signal is in here and down here Okay. Um, now, if I know the avalanche is below me, and um, and there's no, I hadn't got a signal up here. It must be down, down there. It's get, with the old analog ones, this is how we used to. I used to um, uh, work actually just on just on hearing the signal. I just listen until it faded, mark that point, the two points, and then bisect that angle and walk down there. And you can do it exactly. You can actually do. You don't need to do a grid line search. You can do. Um, a, uh, a, a flux line search with a, an analog one. But it's much easier with this because this is going to give me lots of information now. The main thing that it does is it flashes up a light in this corridor and, um, and all I have to do from now on is make sure that it flashes up in the middle. The moment it's flashing to one side like it is there at the moment I just have to turn this slightly that way until it comes into the middle and I keep it in the middle. Now you watch the curve that I will Hopefully. <coughs> All right. Right, if you stay where you are, I guess you can see the curve better. Um, I so he's following the edge of one of those ears around now towards the uh, beacon. So he'll have to probably do a big curve to get to. Okay, but say, say all this is the avalanche area here. How does he know it's not up this side of the... Of the we have a signal up this way and a signal down that way. And well, the avalanche happened when we were up there. What you'd hope with an avalanche is, first thing you could hope for is that you, you've only got one person buried and you've got one, two, three people who've actually followed the person skiing down. It's very important to observe your friends and always keep them in sight. And uh, you have an idea of where that person went under the snow for the last time. And you want to kind of mark that spot mentally or point to where the spot is. And they, they won't be above that spot, so they'll be below there. So you'll start searching down. When you pick up a signal, they should still be okay, below you. It's 2.2 at the moment. Keeping it flashing in the middle. 1.7. 1.6, 1 1.5, 1 1.3, 1 1.9, it's even getting a bit excited, but it's just directing <laughs> me this way. 0 0.7, 0 0.8, oh, it's gone back up again. Okay, so at this point, I'm, I'm not absolutely certain of quite where it is, so I'm going to just use 0.8 as my sort of reference, and maybe, maybe 1, 1 meter. Oh, I've got 0 0.6, 0 0.9, and a bit confused. So at this point, it's definitely getting confused. I'll just mark that. I'll go back this way till I get to 1 again. Yeah, 1 1.4, 1 1.2, 1 1.1. 1's there. Okay, now I'll go this way. Let's come out this way. 0 0.6, 0 0.8. Now yeah, it's getting confused again. 1 is there. See what I'm doing? I'm blocking it off. Go this way. 1.1. 
confused there. 1.11's 1. 1. 1. 1. there. Well, the likelihood is it's going to be somewhere in the middle of this box. Let's have a stab at that. Just a uh, thing to note, notice how... <laughs> Excellent. Notice how slowly Nick did the final search. He wasn't... But if you're panicked and you've got a, somebody under the snow, it's very easy to go too quickly over the snow. He went very slowly there. You've got to keep a cool head, and I think that causes yeah. quite a lot of problems. Just, just, just to get that final bit. So three parts. You know, finding the first signal, going across the avalanche debris. Then you do your flux line search, which, as you saw, was pretty fast, pretty easy. And then just find the fine search at the end, which is a kind of grid, grid little search there.